Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Top secret news just in. This book, Assassin's Edge by Ward Larson is so secret that it had to be (laughs) white-labeled. Okay, I'm kidding. But uh, it's an art copy, okay? So they just hadn't finished everything. But hey, welcome to the show, or almost. Ward Larson's on the show today, and I'm very excited. Two reasons. Assassin's Edge, and he's got a huge piece of news he's going to share near the end of the show. So it's going to kind of... Make you want to stick around, right? All right, let's get to it. He's waiting. Let's get into the thriller zone. It is such uh, an honor to have you on the show. It feels like we should know each other as much as I have watched you yeah, and followed you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think being on the different coasts has something to do with it, you know? Yeah, where are you located? Uh, Sarasota, Florida, oh. West Coast. God, it's beautiful there. Yeah, right now it is. Yeah, no, I won't say that in August probably. But yeah. right now it's great. Yeah, that's the thing about San Diego. It's always beautiful. It is, yeah. That's, I think, my favorite overnight I do with Southwest because we stay right down there on the bay, and uh, it's uh, it's a beautiful. I love like, going out for a run or a walk along the bay, and you know, I got the Navy base there and all the ships, and it's it's really nice. Oh, Yeah. It's uh and and it's such an easy commute from your hotel to the airport, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad. There's worse. <laughs> My wife and I were t- out to dinner the other night, <clears throat> and we were sitting um, at a restaurant. And as you know, as you've been through San Diego so many times, the planes come overhead, and I don't mean just you know, oh, they're coming overhead. You can look in the windows. Oh yeah, yeah. As you're sitting on the street having dinner. You, you can see the expressions on the people's face in the. <laughs> well, they always land in the same direction, always to runway 27. So you're coming in from the east and there's a big hill just on that uh, east side of the airport. So you come in over that. It's a real unique approach. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a lot of pictures. There are photographers that will set up on some of those buildings. There's like a parking garage yep. uh, real close to the airport. And they'll take those pictures where you see the, you know, you're just right there looking at the guy and you see his sunglasses, you know, in the cockpit. And it's, yeah. it's pretty spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've always wanted to say you're cleared on runway 27. <laughs> yeah. You've heard it often. Oh, man. Well, we're going to get to uh, this this dandy little book, The Assass- or Assassin's Edge. This was so top secret, uh, Ward. They had to put it in this white wrapper. So Yes, exactly. <laughs> so many sections are blacked out. I, I don't know what that means. But it's so- <laughs> no, we're going to talk about Assassin's Edge. A book so top secret that they, it was actually delivered by Courier and the guy. Yeah. Had a, <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's start with this. As I get to know Mr. Larson, I'd love to know how did your, how and when did your love of espionage and spies and special ops and page turning thrillers begin? I mean, are you one of these guys that, 
you know, at a really, really early age, you're like, yep, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, not at all. No, I, I was always a reader. I always liked to read and I tended to gravitate towards the espionage uh, books, uh, especially back in college. But I never took any formal writing courses. Uh, you know, I took freshman English in college and that was it. I never did anything beyond that. And uh, but I was always a reader and uh, I got, you know, going on the early Robert Ludlum and the Frederick Forsyth and that kind of thing. And uh, that hooked me. And then I, you know, I, I was in the military and I still read quite a bit, but uh, never had any thought about being a writer. And then when I left the Air Force and got hired by Southwest, um, I had a lot of time on my hands. I'd have long overnights, so I was reading more. And I think one day I just read a book that really wasn't particularly good. And I just thought I could do better than that, you know, through side and, and just started doing it on a whim, just seeing if I could write a book. It wasn't like I needed it to do. You know, I wasn't trying to make a living out of it. I just wanted to see if I could do it. And it took many years to get that first one down, The Perfect Assassin. And, uh, and then what I did, I had to you know, do something with it. And uh, I just got lucky and got published right off the bat by a small publisher. And it's been, you know, well, where's the next book? And it's been a book a year ever since. You know, your story ward is so uh, vastly different than a lot that I hear on this show. I mean, for you to... I, I share a similar experience in that I just one day went, man, I, I've always been a reader and I, I'd love to just give my, give it a shot. But for you to do that and say, yeah, I, I think I can do that. If, if this guy can do it, I can do it. And then to get published right away, that is the anomaly. Haven't you found that to be the case? Yeah. I mean, I got very lucky and I think it was a little easier back in the day. Cause I got my first book published in 2005 and I think it was a little different back then. Now with self-publishing, you know, there's just so many people trying to do it, trying their hand at it. And I think it's, it's a lot lower odds right now. But, you know, it, it can be done. It's, it's still, I think, all about the quality of the book and, you know, and making a good story. Now, here's an interesting question, because a lot of my listeners are in this point. When you sat down, you said, you know what, I think I've got the chops to do that. And you did it. Did you set out to say, well, let's see, in 2005, yeah, self-publishing was around, but it was really probably thin about then. But did you say to yourself, oh, you know what? I, I, worst case scenario, I can self-publish. Best case scenario, I'm going to go after an agent. Which one was that? I had a, I tried the agent thing. I tried sending out the query letters to you in New York for a couple of months, got nowhere, got a, you know my share of rejections. And, uh, and I, I just happened to have a friend, an acquaintance I had met at the gym I go to, who published, self-published children's books. And he uh, said, well, yeah. And he was an English, retired English teacher, a PhD in English. So he read the right book. He liked it, gave me some suggestions. And, uh, and then I just, I did go well with him and he kind of steered me into a printing company here where I live and uh, printed up a few copies and started selling them at a local bookstore. And within two months, uh, that bookstore owner had read it, liked it, gave it to a publisher, Ocean View Publishing, which was just forming up at the time. And uh, I, was the, the, I was the second book Ocean View Publishing bought. And uh, they've kind of made a, they're a very small publisher, but uh, I did five books with Ocean View and then moved down the to tour after that. So I, I just was in the right place at the right time. You know, I just, I got lucky. Okay. I have not heard that story before. I think I've certainly daydreamed of that. I'm sure some of my <laughs> listeners have daydreamed, hey, I'll just print up a handful of copies and stick them in a bookstore and hope that maybe the owner or someone, you know, coming through will go, oh, there's a great book. Let's get this one published. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, one of the sad things about that is that bookstore no longer exists. You know, we've lost a lot of independent bookstores and, uh, you know, they they went out of business and the owners, there were two co-owners, but one in particular was really a great salesperson and just a good people person. She really knew how to steer people to the kind of books that they like. And, you know, I think we've lost some of that in, in recent years. And, uh, and, and I kind of miss that. That is a tragedy. I, you know, I think it was probably started happening. Would you say around COVID and they started dropping off because people weren't able to go there and it was too much overhead and so forth. And then they've kind of followed suit and, you know, with the advent of online shopping, et cetera, but boy, there is nothing like, I don't remember who I heard this recently, but they were talking about there's nothing like walking into a bookstore. It's the smell, it's the energy, it's the discovery. It's the feeling of, Oh, I can find some, some little hidden jewel. And yeah, I'm with you. It's just, it's tragic. 
<laughs> yeah, and the advent of Kindle and eBooks really was the big threat for a time, you know, because that's when all the you know, borders went out, Walden went out, and we lost a lot of chain bookstores as well. Yeah. But, uh, and, you know, I talk to a lot of people about books and what format they prefer. And a lot of people do still like that, to have the feel of that book in their hands. And, uh, and others just, you know, like eBooks because they're cheaper and easier. They can travel with them easier. So it's, you know, different people like different things, but, uh, you know, there's still room for both. And I think the market is kind of stabilized out where, you know, the publishers will tell you, you know, they sell a certain percentage and it's not changing a whole lot at this point. Oh, it isn't. No, I think it's kind of stabilized for the last few years, as I understand it. I mean, COVID may have had some, you know, effect on it, but it's it's kind of stabilized out. And I think print sales are steady. They're not great, but they're holding steady. And audiobooks have become a big deal. That's really yeah. been the, the growth here in the last few years. I don't know what it is, but uh, I, I'm, I don't know if it's I'm old fashioned. Uh, I'm just old. <laughs> But I love feeling it and turning the page and, you know, because I'll also make, I know this is a, a tragedy to some people, but I'll make little notes in it. Or if I'm going to be talking about something particular, I'll, I'll make a note in the side. But there's just nothing like having it in my hands. But yeah, back to your point about audiobooks, skyrocketing, and they say there's no end in sight so far. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, a guy named PJ Auckland uh, has been narrating my books lately, and uh, I really like the job he does with it. And, you know, the publishers tell me it's uh, it's really been a growth business. You know, people can do it anywhere. They can stop and start, do it at the gym when they're running, and it really is a time filler, which, you know, that's one of the things that we struggle with as authors right now is that everybody's got so much going on and so many devices in their hand and so much competition for their attention. And that's one of the reasons, you know, James Patterson did great. His big genius thing was to was to shorten the chapters to where little tiny bite sizes where you can, you know, look a little bit at a time and then come right back to it. And that's, you know, that's kind of where literature is gone, not those big, long tomes of, you know, chapters that are, you know, 50 pages long. Yeah. It's funny. I read someone recently, now that you mentioned that, and I grabbed this book and I went, some, I'll do a couple things when I grab a book. I'll, I'll, I'll see what the page length is just for my own curiosity. I'll, and then I'll check how many chapters. And this particular book was, uh, was 17 chapters. And I'm like, but it's 350 pages. And then uh, as you get into it, you realize, oh, they, those are long chapters. <laughs> and that's well and good. And I remember the days back in the days when you would go on and on and on and, and you didn't think about it. But I don't know if it's, Ward, I don't know if it's a combination of, shortening attention spans, uh, uh, competition for our uh, attention. But yeah, I'm with you. And, and I got to admit, Patterson probably was the first or at least the first that comes to mind that made those little snacking bite sized yep. chapters yep. that you're like, oh, I can just do one more, maybe just one more. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So you you went you were in the Air Force, and then you became an airline pilot and you fly for Southwest, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I, I had this question and um, besides writing bestsellers, do you find yourself, well, because you're both full-time in two different occupations, do you find those that you can squeeze in time in, fly, in between flights or while you're running <laughs> on a flight? To, in flights? <laughs> I heard you're about to say in flight. Yeah. yeah sorry. I meant to say. <laughs> I wouldn't I, do such a thing. <laughs> oops. I meant uh, in between flights. Uh, do you, do you squeeze in that time to work on a book? Yeah. With the airlines, you tend to have dead time. As we all know, you get flights that are delayed where you sit for an hour or 12 overnights where I'll spend, you know, and you know, 20 hours in San Diego. Well, San Diego, I go outside and get around. I won't sit in the room and write, but you know, if I'm in Midland, Texas, I'm probably getting some writing done. <laughs> so yeah, it, it does. It does. And also I have a lot of days off. I have a very flexible schedule. So the two kind of go well together. So yeah, it's, it's, it works out well. I always thought the, the, some of the coolest work schedules belong to pilots, flight attendants, and school teachers, because school teachers get these big fat summers off and you guys get chunks of time. Now you'll work relentless hours when you're working, but then you'll get ch big chunks of time off. Yeah, you, you work some long days. Most days are 10, 11, 12 hours. And nowadays, you know, if you get late, then they tend to be more than that. But uh, so it's long days, but it's not that many of them. I usually work three days a week and I'm senior enough where I can really control my schedule and work as little or as, you know, as much as I want. So it's it's pretty convenient. But yeah, it's it's, it's a good schedule. It's hard. You know, a lot of flight attendants will go into that business and 
thinking, well, I'll just, you know, travel the world and, you know, see things for a few years. And then they, they get to where they, they can't get that kind of money for that kind of schedule doing anything else. And they end up doing it for 30 years, you know, which wasn't really their plan going in. Right. But it's kind of a lifestyle you get used to. And it's, it's you, know, you can live anywhere you want, basically. Uh, I know a lot of people who commute, as we call it, where, you know, I did it for a while where I lived in Sarasota, but I flew out of Baltimore. So I would just have to, you know, spend a half day going into work and flying up to Baltimore uh, every week. And then same thing on the way back. So it's, yeah, it it's gives you a lot of freedom. It's cool. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this one book that hasn't all of America read it yet by a, a first-time author, T.J. Newman, in the book Falling. Did you read that? I did read it, yes. Yeah. yeah. First of all, what did you think of it? It must have spooked Oh, it was you good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Could t yeah, I could tell it was somebody in the industry who had written it, definitely, yeah. Yeah, enjoyed yeah. it. It gave me a whole new respect for what it takes to be both a flight attendant and a pilot as, and I think this is what it is, because you never know what any which you're going to face on any given day, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. This day and age in particular, <laughs> you get some, some crazy stuff going on out there. Uh, yes, I would say that. What do you think, uh, with that in mind, and I think this is a pretty fair question, what, what's the biggest fear you have as a pilot? I, I just have always wondered that because, I mean, you're sitting at the a helm of, uh, with your hands full of uh, hundreds of souls at a time what's 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 something like that go through your head you know it's i have been doing it for many years now and i've never really had a situation where i really thought oh oh god this is this is it you know it's more nuisance kind of things like weather having to you know go around weather and taking long delays things like that and just having very long days um the, you know mechanical things um the, you know the kind of things like happened to the max eight you know the max eight which which crashed overseas uh it's, it's just so rare uh, this is something i i talk about in in my my talks because i actually when i was in the air force i went to their accident investigation school so i learned how to kind of do accident investigation so i got into that a bit and um when I talk, sometimes I'll talk about, you know, the safety of air travel. When was the last um, air crash of a U.S. carrier? Can you remember? No. It was November 2001, right after 9-11. It was uh, taken off, an Airbus uh, taken off out of JFK that went into the bay. And, but that was over 20 years ago. And that's, and I, and I look back and I looked at how many crashes there were in the 1960s, that decade of major air carriers. And it was one a month. So the level of say, and, and now we fly 13 times as many people as we did back then. So the level of safety has just gone through the roof. I mean, yes, there are still incidents occasionally, but it's exceedingly rare. And, uh, you know, I could say I've been flying for nearly 30 years now. And I just haven't had anything that really, you know, put my heart in my throat. I mean, I've had some situations you deal with, but it just wasn't anything that bad. Yeah. You know, um, there's a question that uh, writers often get, and uh, I, I'm sure you've been asked it a hundred times when they go, where do you come up with ideas for books? And I, I always instantly go to, um, all you got to do is keep, be awake. I mean, all you got to do is look around you at any given day. <laughs> Yesterday I'm driving, I, uh, something was happening in front of me, just random. And my mind instantly went, what if that situation right there were turned on its head? And I'm just, you know, sitting in a stoplight and I came home and made some notes and within a, a half hour, I had a paragraph for an idea. So uh, it seems so easy to me, but you know, how do, what do they, they ask you that all the time, you know? Yeah, sure. And you know, writers, as writers, we're looking for those things. And we, when we, we see them, we do just what you did. You write it down because otherwise I'm going to forget it. Uh, but yeah, we, we look in a daily lives and, and look for that. But, you know, it kind of depends what you write, too. I mean, if you're writing historical fiction, it's a little different. But, you know, I, I read the paper every day, at least once, at least one paper a day. I try to keep up with current events because I write contemporary thrillers, military themed. So, you know, this war on Ukraine, a lot of it's going on there. And, yeah, like you say, there's so much going on in the world. If you just watch it and follow, you can, you can, you can come up with ideas. But the thing is, in my genre, you know, generally you're trying to put the world at risk in some way. 
Right. And that means, you know, biological, chemical, nuclear, or basically World War III. And there's only so many ways to do that. And they've all been tried, you know, a thousand different times in the last month by writers at various levels. So it's, it's hard to come up with fresh angles on those things. So that's what I do. And that's really the hardest part I have when I think of a new book. It's just, you know, how am I going to approach this? What's the angle? What's the... And a lot of them end up doing with aviation because I know that, you know, I sure. can stick that in there. But, uh, but yeah, just, you know, keeping up with current events because yeah. that's, that's where it comes from. Write what you know and look around you. I mean, you can pull up the headlines. Like I get um, the New York Times uh, on my phone with just the bullet points of headlines. And if you can't come up with a, just even a short story, which is my way to practice, out of one headline, then maybe you need to rethink your career. You know? Right. <laughs> All the time. Yep. Yeah. Hey, besides your Jammer Davis series, which is, uh, let me see, Fly by Night and Fly by Wire. Fly by Wire and Passenger yeah. 19. Or three, Passenger 19. Let's talk about uh, David's Latin series. And there's a, a whole bunch of assassins. I won't read them all out because, uh, what is it, like 9, 10, 11? There's 12. 9. Yeah, I'm working yeah. on number 10 right now. But what, let's, let's start with this one because this is the one I, I have read. Well, the top secret one, of course, that uh, not yes. everyone get, gets to see. <laughs> Um, I can tell my listeners all day long how um, the pages seem to turn themselves, which uh, I try to come up with a different phrase of that every single time as I got into the book. But what I want you to do, can you give me a nice synopsis of this so that I don't release any hooks on it or give anything away about this latest? Okay. Uh, the, the kind of the concept behind it was, again, I'm looking for something contemporary, something that hasn't been done. And I, I get uh, Aviation Week and Spec Technology, the magazine, and it's a kind of an industry magazine, and it really has a lot of up-to-date stuff on both commercial and defense-related aviation things, aviation and space. And I, I just got to thinking that, you know, there are some weapons coming out that are really going to kind of change warfare. And we've kind of seen that in Ukraine. There's some, you know, the, the tank army of the Soviet Union is not uh, doing real well against some of the anti-tank weapons that the Ukrainians have been getting. So my theory was, you know, going forward, take some of these uh, high tech weapons that are either on the board or in test or actually out there and, have the United States getting attacked by those weapons, but they don't know where it's coming from. Because that's another big thing these days, it's attribution, you know, you got to figure out who's attacking you, especially in cyber, you know, it's, you, know, you get a cyber attack, how do you know where it's really coming from? Is it state sponsored? Is it for profit? And so I, I had some, the U.S. getting attacked with a couple of high tech weapons and the government trying to figure out where is this coming from? And, uh, and plus, I introduce these weapons, I think, to readers that, that are just kind of on the horizon. See, this is what sets you apart, in my opinion, <clears throat> from a lot of writers and not disparaging in any way, shape or form. It's just kind of part of the system. But being able to learn, uh, you, you, you catch yourself going, wait a minute, does that actually exist yet? And then so you're putting us right on that precipice of things that we do know, things that we don't know, things that we think we know, but we're not sure. And therein lies the intrigue that makes me just go, wow. Yeah, it's very close. And and sometimes, you know, as a, as a no, no more security clearance, as it's a non-classified observer, I see things and I just kind of wonder, you know, like many, remember years ago, back at the end of the Obama administration, North Korea was launching a lot of uh, ICBMs. They were testing a lot of ICBMs and they had crash after crash after failure after failure and a whole bunch of them in a row crashed. And I got to thinking, is there a reason for that? Do we have some kind of directed energy weapon that we're training on these things and causing that to happen? It's yeah. very conceivable. Yeah. Oh, man. So that was one of those little things. Like you say, you see it in the news and it's like, yeah, hey, there's an idea and you write it down and yeah, maybe. Yeah. As I was working on the show art, which I just shot to you, and you made a funny comment. You said, oh, man, I look so young in that art. And I'm like, dude, you, you, haven't, cha you haven't changed in 40 years. I don't, know, I don't know what you're eating or drinking, but you'll look fantastic. Formaldehyde works every morning. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just uh, amazed at, uh, at that. And I was reading, uh, so what, what, one of the things that always catches my, everyone knows that, that a blurb on a book will sell you. And Kyle um, Mills makes this quote. 
He's a New York Times bestselling author, in case anyone doesn't know that. A smart, edgy techno thriller that provides a glimpse into tomorrow's battles and the weapons they'll be fought with, which is what we were just talking about. And that quote alone is enough for you to pick up the book. Well, let's hope. Yeah, Kyle was very gracious to have a look at the book, and he, he seemed to really like it, and he was, he was very good. I think we made a video together at one point to promote his, his recommendation of it. But yeah, he, he was very good about it. And, and I'm always curious to learn, especially with uh, prolific authors as yourself. I mean, anytime you pass, uh, reach close to a dozen, I, I feel like that's pretty dang prolific. I always wonder where you, where the protagonist comes from. So is David Sl Slayton, uh, is, is that kind of kind of an inner hero? Is this the uh, somebody that you wish you could have been one day or, you know, he has attributes that you share that, man, if I could supersize these into uh, hero action uh, level that they would be? Or is it just I just want to dream up this guy out of nowhere? Yeah, I mean, he has, of course, those attributes that we can all relate to and aspire to. But, you know, that goes back to the, the or beginnings of the series, as I told you, when I started writing it. Um, I had gravitated to that kind of book, the military thrillers. And even then, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were quite a few of those characters out there. And I was looking for something a little different because David Slayton is Israeli. He started with Mossad. And, uh, and I came up with that because I wanted something a little different than kind of everybody else had out there. And the reason I chose Israeli was uh, actually went back to a real life experience. When I was uh, an instructor pilot in the Air Force, we had a guy come into our squadron for a checkout in an airplane at Tyndall Air Force Base. And he was Israeli. And, uh, and he was like the chief test pilot of the Israeli Air Force at one point. He had shot down MiGs in combat and he, he had just you know, done everything you could do as a pilot. So, you know, I'm training him. It was kind of backwards. But you can see he gave, he gave a talk one day about his experiences and it was, you know, it was very impressive. But I was really taken by the guy's mindset, his attitude. And, you know, the Israeli military has this attitude that the first war we lose is going to be the last. And they are just ultra focused, uh, or this guy was in particular, he just really struck me as just totally ultra focused on, you know, doing his job in the military. And that struck me as a kind of character that would go forward, you know, as David Slayton does and have that kind of single mindedness that I think really helps build a character. Yeah. And to that point, it was interesting that you, that this character is a little bit uh, different off the beaten path because you sit down and you think about, say the top 10 uh, espionage action thriller characters and they all are really quite similar and i know that there are no original ideas anymore i got that but it it is interesting that we all are searching for that one little thing that's slightly different and that is enough would you agree that that just slight difference is enough to set you apart from the rest of the crowd I think it's unique. Yeah. And I, you know, also the fact that he has a family that he's trying to deal with and trying to, he's kind of trying to stay away from the business, but he kind of gets taken, you know, he keeps getting brought back into it and he's got a, you know, he's got a wife and a kid. And so, uh, you know, that's, that also maybe is a little different than some who are just the solo, you know, operators that just go out and, and lay waste across the world. <laughs> You just made me think of the, you just used the line almost. We were watching The Godfather over the weekend, just be, I guess because we saw it on the Oscars and we wanted to relive that moment. And was it, it's uh, uh, Pacino that says, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Ward, before we get to rapid fire questions, I got a question. It's probably asked a hundred times, but it's, I ask all my New York New York Times bestselling authors, the international bestselling authors, as well as the indie press stars on the horizon authors, the same question that, and that is this, if you were to share a single best piece of it, writing advice, and it doesn't have to be single, but it could be, it could be multifaceted, but what's that one thing are my listeners may be thinking about, I, I want to do what Ward does. You know, I've got this book that I think can go out there or, uh, you know, maybe I need to tweak on a little bit more or maybe there are a couple of series in. But what's that one encapsulated piece of advice? Uh, it was kind of imparted on me by a guy named David Hagberg, who passed away a few years ago. He, he wrote 70 or 80 books, David did, and, and mostly in that genre. But uh, I, I knew him pretty well. He lived here where I do. 
And, uh, and it basically is that um, your, your next book is only is going to sell based on your, your previous book. In other words, make the book you're working on as good as you possibly can. And, it, and really, you know, the social media is good, you know, getting out, selling the book, going to conferences. But you got to really put 90% of your time at least into the writing itself, into the stories and the storytelling. And that, I think, is really what will set someone apart as a writer or aspiring writer is uh, is just building that story. That's solid advice. And it makes me think of this because you mentioned social media. We often think that that platform that you hear about constantly has to be so magnificent that sometimes I think we spend a wee bit too much time in the social media push. And I'm certainly guilty of this as anyone else is. And less, maybe not enough time on that book. And and I and this just came to me recently when I was doing one of these one day that you're just scrolling and all of a sudden you realize I've been scrolling for like a half hour. I'm an idiot. I need to stop this. And I thought if I took all this time, all this time and put it toward this book, I could probably make it a little bit better, you know? Yeah, probably make it a lot better. I, I've had certain <laughs> chapters that I've rewritten 40 or 50 times, you know, just to get it perfect. And, uh, and I, you know, I think it's somewhat shy. I don't do it all that way, but yeah. you know, I think, I think it shows in the writing in the long run. And, uh, I, I, that's, that's my, that's my take on it. Yeah. And what's the old saying? You can only make a first impression once. Yeah. And that's, what's going to keep the readers coming back, you know, and right. it's tough because when you do get, you know, a lot of books where you're doing a book a year, you, you have to kind of keep up that standard. And, you know, yeah. if you, if you let it down then you're going to lose some readership over, over time. So, you know, you have to be consistent with it. All right. Well, it is time for rapid fire questions. Uh, if you're familiar with this, it's just a couple of questions. Nobody's going to get hurt. I promise. <laughs> Number one. Uh, and because you're a pilot, you're on a return flight from across the world when suddenly one of your engines just dies out of nowhere. What's the very first thing you do besides say, what the heck? What's the first thing you do? First thing you do is turn to my first officer and ask him to get out the engine failure. This is a checklist. <laughs> it's very procedural up there. It is, isn't it? Everything yeah, is procedure. Yeah, it is, yeah. And that's that's how, you know, that's what you're trained to do. And that's it helps, you know, when those things do happen. I've never lost an engine. I've had a few, you know, burble and cough, but never actually lost one. But, you know, that's, we do it in training all the time. Every year you always lose one and that's, you know, it just becomes kind of force of habit. Yeah. Boy, talking about an oh shit moment. Okay. Well, here's the good news. You've just made an emergency landing on a remote island. Good for you. You're a hero. The landing was actually smoother and softer than Scully himself. So looks like everyone's going to be just fine. One problem, only problem is you're not sure when help was going to arrive. Okay, so what are the two things? This is the this is where the inner Boy Scout in you comes out. What are the two things you're so glad you packed in your travel case? Perhaps something you are never without. What are those two things and why? <laughs> I always bring food with me, oh, so I, I, I have some food that I eat on the road. And uh, probably some sunscreen. Is this a tropical island? <laughs> <laughs> you are a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> and I might stop at the liquor kit on my way out of the airplane. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. I know that Hollywood optioned your book, uh, Perfect Assassin, uh, which was which kicked off the series. Was it the, uh, 2008, right? Yeah. Okay. But let's say you've just been called by Hollywood and they say they want to buy your entire library of assassin books. Whoa. Okay. In order to make them into a Netflix series. Now, by the way, it's enough money that you don't have to work for like five years at least. Question is twofold. Number one, because you're also an executive producer on the series, you get to help select the uh, the actors. So who would be playing David Slatton for you, Slayton for you here in the series? And number two, since they had to back a Brinks truck up to your SUV with all the money you're going to make, what are you going to do for the next couple of years when there's no pressure to really put anything out and why? Uh, Keanu Reeves. I don't know why. I just picture Keanu Reeves is, is in that role. 
Okay. And, and I, everybody says he's a great guy. And, uh, well, I, I would keep writing. Yeah. I, I would be bored without it. Yeah. I mean, what else am I going to do? I mean, I, I have some hobbies and pastimes. Yes. But I, I wouldn't stop writing. I might retire from flying, but I'll yeah. keep writing. That's fair enough. You can retire from flying. You look, Maybe I'll this... write literary fiction. <laughs> would you really? <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. But, but <laughs> David, maybe I'll try my hand at romance. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, fourth and final question. My wife Tammy and I have invited you and your family to join us for a dinner party to celebrate your new Hollywood deal. Congratulations again. Champagne for everyone. Now, here's part of the magic of the evening. You get to invite two people, living or dead, to help spice up the conversation for our dinner. Who would they be and why? You know, my original publisher, Bob Gustin, is just a really interesting guy. And I, I would probably invite him. He's just, he just knows so much about so many things. Just a really neat human being. And, uh, and that's why. And uh, maybe also uh, John Jakes. John Jakes is still around. And I, I actually used to have lunch with him a bit. He's not getting out much anymore. But he's also just a really interesting, lovely person to be around. And uh, he's, you know, he, he, John Jakes wrote, you know, countless books and uh, the North and the South and uh, had many series done about his books back in the eighties. And he was a real big uh, writer back in the day. And uh, yeah, just cause they're, they're good people. They're fun to be around. And uh, I know it would be a, a great dinner. Boy, you just made that so easy. And you, you really are a writer. You're, you're hardcore, right? You, <laughs> it's, it's woven into who you are, isn't it? Yeah. I guess those are the people I gravitate to. Yeah, that is awesome. I did not ask you when the next, well, this one is so new. That one comes out next week, uh, April 12th. And, and after that, I've got two coming out next year. One of this series and uh, I've got a standalone uh, book. coming. This is sort of an announcement. I have a standalone book coming out next March uh, called Deep Fake. It's a political thriller that I, well, I took some time off during COVID uh, from flying. So I actually wrote two books that year. So uh, next year I've got two books coming out. Wow. Deep fake next March. Next March. Yep. That is awesome. And we heard it here first. You did. Yes. Wow. Sweet. Well, folks, if you'd like to learn more about Ward, visit wardlarson.com and follow him as I do on Twitter at Ward Larson. Ward, once again, Thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much for having me, David. I've got a great little surprise for you next week. This is a breakout author. Brian Panowich says, Blackburn writes with the same ferocity as Hammett and James M. Kane. Hello, it dies with you, Scott Blackburn, next week. The, sh the book doesn't actually drop until June, but... Scott let us in on the inside scoop, got us an arc early, and we want to have him on the show to talk all about it. I'm very excited. Also, quick little note. Thank you so much for all your support uh, on the Thriller Zone. We've gotten letters and notes and cards and books sent to us, and we're so appreciative of all the love. We are one of the fastest growing podcasts, I think, in America. Yeah, so there, we said it. You can stop by thethrillerzone.com. You can listen, you can watch, you can leave a voicemail, you can leave us an email. There's so many things you can do. I mean, it's practically a party on a website. You can also go to any one of your favorite podcast channels, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeart, name them. We're almost everywhere right now. And of course, we love five-star reviews. Feel and share the love. <laughs> Folks, I'm David Temple. Thank you once again for listening, and I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.